So welcome everyone. Um, good evening. My name is Marina Otero, and uh, yeah, together with Nick Axel, we are the editors of this uh, work body leisure book. So I'm extremely grateful uh, to the EA and in particular to the director, Eva Frank, and also to Manige for uh, organizing this book launch and this conversation, and also to our guests today who were also contributors to the book. Uh, so the book World Body Leisure uh, was first conceived as the Dutch pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennial in 2018. And the book addresses the spatial configurations modes of living and notions of the human body uh, that are engendered by disruptive changes in uh, labor ethos and conditions. The project uh, imagined uh, that a group of practitioners, designers, researchers, institutions will come together uh, through 2018 and 19 to uh, foster new forms of creativity and responsibility within the architectural field in uh, response to emerging uh, technologies of automation. We believe that this field of research um, is transforming the environment and also the bodies that inhabit it. And yet, uh, it's a still largely the vote of a critical spatial perspective. And perhaps it's also an opportunity, now that we are in this uh, particular series, to define new canonical histories and new ideas about uh, practicing and thinking uh, of architecture. So next to the exhibition in Venice, we develop a series of other projects like performances, podcasts, and um, new research initiatives, and also a book. That is the reason why we are gathering here today. So I'm going to invite uh, Nick to explain a little bit more about the editorial projects, and then we will enter more into the content uh, of the book. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming to Eva, to the contributors, uh, to Maria, to Aisha, um, to Manije. Um, I want to I wanna zoom out um, to start and to speak about this as an editorial project. Um, and I want to start this with a, a somewhat personal reflection on editorial practice. Um, so editorial practice in, in architecture is, or at least was until not too long ago, what I would call a tragedy. Um, with the movement of what came to be canonized uh, first here in that room and then all around the world as the Archazines movement, uh, editing became a question of platforming, of giving opportunity to new voices, which is something that's vital to fostering and the development of new personas, new identities, new, new practitioners. But what makes this a tragedy was that the editorial practice resembled the worst of what we think of as platforms, um, as neutral, as not questioning of content, of allowing absolutely whatever. It was about hype, it was about identity, it was about community, but not so much about engagement, about dialogue, and about thinking. So I personally became an editor because, in, in short, I never had one, um, but I was always looking for one. I became an... <laughs> You know, I, I always wrote knowing that I had something to say, but that I didn't entirely know what or how to say it. Um, I was looking for someone in writing to collaborate with. I was looking for an interlocutor. I couldn't write alone. So from this experience as a writer and my becoming of an editor, I learned that one of the most important characteristics um, of editorial practice is something that we may think of as sympathy. It's about listening. It's about engaging other people in a dialogue in which by giving, with them giving you their raw text and the authority of decision, they're, they're giving their position to you and allowing it to be challenged. But by taking that responsibility, you must also be humble and recognize that your own position is not absolute. So editing for, for me and what I would argue it should be um, is about willing to challenge someone else's position, but it's also about having one's own position be challenged. So editing is really about dialogue, and it's not just about giving space, but also working with. It's about co-creating something that would not and could not have been there otherwise. So now to, to start zooming into this book, um, the intentions, I think, behind this book are, are somewhat similar. Um, what we were trying to do with this was to gather a different series of voices, of backgrounds, of knowledges that, that don't necessarily or immediately relate to each other, but that each contribute with a distinct and invaluable position with regards to this cosmology of concepts being brought together here. 
work, body, leisure. So this book is not about consensus, um, but it's also not about dissensus either. There's no agreement, but also no disagreement. Um, it's, it's a book, and I need to emphasize this, it is not a catalog, um, it is a book um, that asks what happens when you place things, for example, like the philosophical history and radical politics of boredom together with the history of automation in suburban home construction and the coastal landing sites of cross-continental fiber optic cables. It asks what we can learn by thinking about automated logistics together with the at times deadly economy of selfies and the recent history of office design. The answer to these questions are not necessarily known in advance and they're not necessarily known now yet. Um, and these questions also are, are not, uh, that, that reside somewhere in between the contributions, these are not necessarily obvious. Um, so in this sense, the, the book is not easy. Um, it's, it's a challenge to its readers, um, but it also places an incredible confidence and trust in them. It, it tries, I would argue, um, in maybe a, a, a more humble way than I'm, than I'm doing right now, um, to allow us to find each other and, and to hold hands as we, as we grope through this, this unknown dark of, of this present of automation um, in search of, of, a, of a brighter future. So, thank you. So, yeah, thank you, Nick. And, um, so the book charts a journey through a series of architectures in the Netherlands and beyond in which bodies are categorized and transformed. Offices, playgrounds, farms, factories, virtual spaces, windows, beds, and doors. A scenarios that might look familiar, if rarely accessible or seemingly banal, but are nevertheless at the epicenter of the transformation of labor, and serve, perhaps, to redefine notions and spatial conditions of work and leisure, as well as architecture itself. So today we want to emphasize or talk about two main uh, threads in the book. One is about histories about technologies and otherness, and the other is about the relation between work and the domestic space. So I want to start with the first, and I will start with uh, what Mark Weekly thought about revisiting the work of Constant Newhouse. Uh, Constant Newhouse attempt to resolve the dichotomy between work and leisure in his seminal project, New Babylon, that is an architectural paradigm of free space and free time afforded by automation, society will devote its energy to creativity and play. By robotizing labor, Constant demanded the right to not labor and visualize the imminent post-labor world. And yet, as the project evolved, his optimistic vision gradually gave way to a more conflictual perspective. Violence will not be eradicated by the new technological order mobilized by, to satisfy the society needs. Rather, it will reveal as an intrinsic part of such order. New Babylon was an architecture founded on the exploitation and visibility of working bodies conceived as automated machines. The automated machines will allow this elevated construction to be a free space for play for humans. So the question is, would New Babylon be possible without the work of the other? If according to Wigley's reading of New Babylon, architecture was not labor and the world beyond labor is all architecture, Constant not only envisioned the end of architecture and architects as we know it, but also acknowledged the violent and conflictual nature of its practice, something that we will also try to unpack today. More than 40 years after Constant New Babylon, the architecture of full automation is currently being implemented in many countries, and especially across the Netherlands, from the country's main port in Rotterdam to the spaces of greenhouses and dairy farms where humans are being largely uh, replaced by robots. In the project Automated Landscapes, that is by the New Institute with Martin Kaupers and Victor Munjersan, uh, the project claims that if New Babylon, uh, there was an architecture for play, the territory of the Netherlands could be seen as its counterpart, a productive Cartesian landscape designed for unprecedented efficiency. And behind this apparent banality of the landscape, some of the images that you might see in a loop uh, in the screens, 
a mechanic and data file, data file beauty rebates itself, but only through the spaces and the screens of the control rooms or the iPads or the phones through which what was before a farmer uh, now has become a manager controlling these automated bo bodies. The progressive replacement of certain bodies in the productive space due to automation is also at the core of one of the contributors' work, Simon Nikhil. Nikhil talks about the parameters embed in design softwares that are being used to optimize contemporary work spaces. Ergonomic softwares are applied to virtual factories to evaluate works, uh, worker safety, comfort, and productivity before building in brick and mortar. The human body is first measured, rendered as data, and standardized, and ultimately represented as a digital avatar and deployed via these simulations for the design of physical workers and workstations. In shaping architecture, these virtual models define what a human body is and its optimal parameters, while the non-standard body, the unrecorded other, often marginalized in terms of class, gender, race, or disability, is rendered non-existent. Similarly, the work of Liam Young, that probably most of you know, uh, in particular, uh, the Renderlands project. Thinks about these visions of the future designed by Western architectural offices and are actually produced by outsourced rendered farms workers in India. The piece by Lian Zhang takes us behind the scenes of architectural renderings and field production to the work of people whose, whose stories are often ignored by dominant discourses. The reality draws a picture of the human labor involved in architectural practice. So many of these contributors uh, talk about or are aiming to uh, find the spaces of resistance for the fight of non-exploitative, non-discriminatory uh, world. And in particular, uh, Amal Allah uh, focuses on the doors of no return. The doors of no return are a symbol of the transatlantic slave trade from which captive bodies were transported to the so-called new world. The space between the door and the ocean is a site for engineered, rational, racialized body, one that presents the genealogy of violence that precipitated the forced movement of the slave and those still unfolding of the migrant and the refugee. The doors, Allah argues, are present as a violent absence in front of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and every other body of water that carries the histories of the ongoing destruction of the migrant, poor, racialized, and gender body. Yet the door, Amal argues, or rather the threshold between being and not being, is also a site for science fiction, a space for act of refusal, for the radical imaginary of non-exploitative, non-discriminatory world. And on this note, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Ayesha Hamed. Hamed makes moving image, performance, and written work that explores contemporary borders and migration and visual cultures of the Black Atlantic. Her project, Black Atlantis, and a rough history of the destruction of fingerprints, has been performed and exhibited internationally. She is the co-editor of Futures and Fictions 2017, which was nominated for the International Center of Photography's Infinity Award. She's currently the program leader of the MA in Contemporary Art Theory in the Department of Visual Cultures Angle at Goldsmiths. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Ayesha Hamed. Thank you. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm never quite sure how to engage with these microphones, how far or how close I should be. Okay, good? Okay, thank you. So I just want to thank uh, Marina and Nick, uh, just to start off with, um, for their invitation to contribute to the book uh, and, to, and to this launch, and for Nick's patience <laughs> with the many drafts that we went through um, over time. Uh, so my con contribution to the book um, was called Retrograde Futurism, and it's as Marina said, it's a part of a larger project called Black Atlantis, which is a series of lecture performances, films, and sound works, where each chapter is a collection of sounds and images that looks at the Black Atlantic 
and its afterlives in contemporary illegalized migration on the Mediterranean, in oceanic environments, through Afrofuturistic dance floors and sound systems, and in outer space. Using Walter Benjamin's concept of the dialectical image, I examine how to think through sound, image, water, violence, and history as elements of an active archive and of time travel as a historical method. This project as a whole combines two discourses, Afrofuturism and the Anthropocene. It follows a critique by the geographer Phil Sternberg uh, of the Black Atlantic where he says it focuses on the surfaces of the ocean rather than its depths. And as a result of this, the wetness of the ocean is lost and thus its haptic tactile quality is lost as well. So a key methodological thread of Black Atlantis is to take the story of Grexia, an electronic band from Detroit whose mythos, built through liner notes, describe a story where children born of pregnant slaves thrown overboard were able to adapt to living underwater as they went straight from living in amniotic fluid to ocean water and so built a Black Atlantis called Drexia. Using Drexia as a method brings the Black Atlantic below the water with its imaginary of a Black Atlantis comprised of former slaves living underwater. What wetness brings back to the table is a sense of a haptic, the sensory, the bodily, and the epidermal. What below the water and Atlantis brings back is the bottom of the sea, the volume of the water, the materiality of the space of the ocean, and other protagonists that inhabit the sea. And what Drexia brings into this whole thing is time travel as a historical method. So apart from being a book chapter uh, in, in the book that we're launching today, retrograde futurism has taken on a few different forms. Uh, it's been a lecture performance, and it's also been uh, made into a film called A l'ombre de nos fantômes, or In the Shadow of Our Ghosts, which I made with the artist Hamadine Khan for the 2018 Dakar Biennial, and was also shown at the showroom as a part of an exhibition called Working Practices last year as well. Um, but both the film and the performance follow the same migrant ship that sailed from Cape Verde to the Canary Islands and then finally drifted to Barbados. So I'm gonna show you a bit of this film um, and then say a little bit more afterwards. I'd like to send to my family in Basada a sum of money. Please excuse me and goodbye. This is the end of my life in this big Moroccan sea. I am from Senegal, but I've been living in Cape Verde for a year. Things are bad. I don't think I'll come out of this alive. I need whoever finds me to send this money to my family. Please telephone my friend Ibrahim Adwame. Signed, Jao Sunkajimi.
On April 29, 2006, a 20-foot boat was boarded off the southeastern coast of Barbados. On board, 11 bodies were found by the Coast Guards, preserved and desiccated by the sun and salt water. The ghost ship was adrift for four months on the Atlantic Ocean. It set sail on Christmas Day in Praia in Cape Verde Islands, full of migrants from Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, and Gambia, en route to the Canary Islands. Each of these people paid 890 pounds for their place on the boat. The boat ran into travel at Noadibu, a Mauritanian port, and was towed towards its destination for a time by another ship. An article in The Guardian conjectures that the line was severed, possibly by being hacked with a machete. Once adrift, the ship began its slow movement across the Atlantic, buffeted by winds and rain, and pulled westward by the ocean's currents. By January, all the passengers had died, with many of their bodies either jettisoned into the sea or washed overboard. The ghost ship then traveled the 2,800 miles to Barbados. The names of Mami Wata, Maulisu, Mami Wata, Yemonja Kwiti Kwiti, Mboze, Makanga, Bunzi, Kambisi, Moana, Madre de Agua, Yemania, La Sirene, Madame Poisson, Mamba Muntu, Maman de l'eau, Maman de l'eau, Maman Glo, the soul, the water and the sun, both destroyed Mami and preserved Wata. the bodies of these 11 men huddled together in the cabin. Mama Dilo. Ma But Wata. they are a small fraction of the 40 odd men Mama they set Dio. off with who died Mama and Dio. were washed overboard into the sea. Mama Dilo. Watra Mama. Through this, those bodies become something Mama else. Lambo. The forces of the sea, its salt water, wind, and sun, corrugate River and envelop them. River Maiden. They make the bodies a part Mama of the ravages of the sea and connect them Mama to the others not seen that fell Mama into the ocean. The sea, a force, fossilizes the bodies of these men Mama who died on board destroying and preserving them. Abanamen. The force of the Yemoja. sea winds and weather is insidious Lep. and complicit in the transformation of these dead men into fossils of the sea. They have become a part of the archive of sea, understandable in part only through the sea. Water mama. Watra Mama, Maman de l'eau, Mama de l'eau, Maman de l'eau, Maman de l'eau, Mama de l'eau. So retrograde futurism brings the Drexian haptic commingling of bodies and water as an inhabitable environment to the surface of the ocean. Above the sea, the rain, sun, and salt water of the weather brings another conjunction of elements, another amalgamated inhabitation that produces another kind of subjectivity that also brings the bodies on board this ship into a constellation with the boat that they were on when they died. The corroding of bodies that confers life to the boat as a ghost ship or a coffin ship is a kind of futurist amalgamation 
of humans and machines gone retrograde, where here the machine carries the weight of dissolution and death. Both ship and bodies carry traces of life and death. The sea wind and salt water are the catalyst and medium that confers contingency onto both, a suspension between life and death, an animism and horror that can only make sense through the operation of state power that sends these men and boats to sea and strands them there as a force inextricable from the weather. The boats drift along the same route that bore slave ships from West Africa to Barbados centuries before, forms another undercurrent of horror of this journey. One journey recapitulates the deaths meted out in another. The forces of the weather and the fact of the jettisons of enslaved men and women by ship's captains, coupled with the laws that permitted them to do so, amplify the same desperate gestures of the men who died on board this ghost ship. This is a story that retrograde futurism follows. And hopefully this exploration of the anthropocentric Drexian ocean as an environment and the temporal disjuncture that the ghost ship embodies and the horror of its journey can add to our conversation today. Thank you. Um, so I want to, uh, when this loads, um, I want to introduce uh, the second, um, the second strain of the of the evening and the second uh, facet of the discourse that we're that we're trying to canonize. Uh, let's see, let's see how well that goes, though. Um, so as as Marina mentioned. Um, one of the key strands in this book is uh, situating the space and the idea of domesticity, again, within this constellation of concepts. Um, and so one of the main departure points for this um, is the contribution by Beatrice Colomina, uh, who was also a contributor to the pavilion, um, on, the, uh, on the 1969 uh, bed-in for peace protest by, by John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Um, this took place in the Hilton Hotel, even though it was uh, repeated in a number of other places in Montreal, et cetera. Um, so in the, John and Yoko went to the Hilton for their honeymoon, uh, but they invited press to visit them from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, so this bed-in, as you can kind of see on the back, uh, hair piece and bed piece, it was staged as a protest against the Vietnam War. Uh, and. Beatrice uh, departs from this as, an, as a way to understand uh, the way that, um, so sorry, this is just a, you can rent this suite mm -hmm. if you want to today in, uh, in the Hilton. It looks a little bit different. It looks actually a bit more real if you go to the new institute right now where the installation is. Um, but so Beatrice uh, uses this as a departure point to understand the way that uh, work, and particularly office work, has been folded into the realm of sleep and the bed. Um, so this is an advertisement that if you've seen her speak before, you've probably seen. It's a Bluetooth technology advertisement in 2014, allows you to collaborate in bed, gives you the, you know, the luxury. Um, at the same time, this is from, uh, from 2007, uh, the Metronaps Energy Pod, which is the world's first chair designed for napping in the workplace. Um, but this this confluence or this overlapping of uh, a, the, the activity of work and the space of leisure, the bed, um, this is not something particularly, um, particularly novel. I mean, this is a photograph of Hugh Hefner from the 50s um, with his famous uh, technological bed. But at the same time, uh, this is Richard Neutra's uh, bedroom in the VDL house that was equally connected. Um, but so there, there is this... Um, there is an element, and Beatrice speaks about uh, a transposition of uh, work onto a space of leisure. Um, but a part of this book also looks at a, a somewhat longer history of an entanglement between these two terms. Um, because as we know, work is, is not just paperwork. It's not just office work. I mean, the office itself is, as, uh, you know, as Giorgio Gombin states, it's a, it's a rather Catholic understanding of duty. Um, and it's funny to actually think of the Vatican as the longest 
continuously inhabited office space in the world, thanks to <laughs> Stefan Peterman for that, uh, for that observation. Um, but so, you know, this, this, uh, the, the, our domestic investigation in this book, um, it's not just about the transposition of the office onto the bed. It's not about, uh, you know, the prosthetics that allow this transposition, but rather understanding the bed and what takes place under the sheets as a site and activity of work in and of itself. Um, so another crucial contribution to this book is an image essay by Anne-Marie de Vilt, who's a curator at the Amsterdam Museum. Um, on the history of prostitution in the Netherlands. So this is a, this is a very famous photograph by a, by a Dutch photographer, Cor Yaring, um, of one of the first uh, window uh, prostitutes in 1968, Parisia Lane. Um, and you know, it's, it's a quite typical image of a woman sitting in a window because when we think of Amsterdam, this is probably what we think. Um, this, is, this is the image of the red light district, this space that has been given over to, um, you know, to prostitution. And it's not just an architectural typology here, it's an urban typology that almost gets reduced to a color of red. Um, similarly, it's, it's an interior. Um, we saw some of these images before. These are photographs from Tess Youngblood from 2008 to 2014, documenting the interiors of these, uh, of these red light spaces. Um, some <laughs> common features is always the locker, which you'll also see as it was one of the main design features in the pavilion, um, and also, as you can see quite clearly here, an alarm button. Um, but so I, I want to return to this photograph to, to maybe shed light onto a different history because we should not so quickly assume the Netherlands, the space that champions itself as the, as, you know, as the pioneer of liberalism, to have always been liberal. This photograph was actually taken when the prostitution was illegal. This was an illegal activity that was taking place. Um, there was a Dutch Decency Act of 1911 that was in force in, until the, the 1970s or 80s. Um, so this, this illegalization of prostitution, it not just uh, gave birth to um, a more private industry where you actually needed to use uh, the curtains to be able to protect yourself and to save yourself from the eyes of the law. Um, it also created distinct urban typologies. Um, this is a, uh, a parking lot um, that was used for prostitution in Utrecht, but you can see this typology repeated throughout the Netherlands, also in Rotterdam, et cetera. Um, and similarly, this is a neighborhood that was, uh, you know, each of these houseboats was, was, uh, was inhabited by, by a single prostitute at a time. I mean, or more than one, if that's what you were paying for, I guess. Um, so, you know, in, in kind of weird Dutch fashion, this was also, you know, uh, embraced, whether it was illegal or legal, it was embraced uh, through design, through planning. So these are some objects um, that, that kind of characterized these um, these neighborhoods, so the tipple zone is the prostitution zone, so they even had their own, um, yeah, their own garbage can, and they have these, uh, these signs, like uh, you're, you're not allowed to work on the docks, as, uh, as the bottom one says. Um, so prostitution, you know, as, as one of the, as if not the oldest, uh, you know, profession in, in, in history, um, and this kind of orge, you know, this, this original, uh, overlapping between work and leisure um, was replicated or, or was, was followed up um, in, in, other, in other contributions as well. In recognizing what uh, work is, um, we felt it necessary to, uh, to republish the seminal text by Sylvia Federici, Wages Against Housework, um, which is calling for the economical uh, recognition of gendered domestic labor. Um, but then next to this, uh, you know, in, maybe in response to these protests, of course, there is, there is technology, there is automation to try and save the day. Um, it always presents itself as the solution, but very rarely does it ever actually alter the underlying conditions and power relations of gender, race, age, and identity. Um, so th this, is a, this is a design project from the Austrian designer Hasso Hermann, um, which was effectively the, the first fully automated uh, kitchen, what he called the, the ETV, the Electra Techno Vision. Um, so this is, a, this is a detailed photo, and I mean, look at how much fun and leisure is now taking place where, uh, where work used to. Um, so, you know, what, one of the things that, that Hermann was uh, said in describing this project is that, you know, the, the woman, quote, no longer goes to the individual appliances, rather the appliances would come to her. Um, and so, you know, to, to quote Marina from, from the, the editorial, uh, or sorry, the curatorial statement at the beginning of the book, 
Um, automated technologies are often envisioned not to liberate, but to support women in the perpetuation of unpaid domestic and reproductive labor. Um, and with that, I, I will um, hand the mic and the presentation uh, over to uh, Maria Ciducci, um, who writes, uh, if I can maybe hand off with, with a single, uh, single quote from their contribution to this book, um, which is a, uh, an excavation in archaeology of uh, otium, um, that reproduction, as femini feminism teaches us, is not leisure, and work can never be kept out of the house. Thank you so much, Nick, for this uh, really, uh, I mean, really great introduction. And it's really, it's very much spot on because it's going to allow me to jump immediately in the, sorry. Sorry. You know, women and technology. <laughs> Okay, I think it was a really uh, a great experience, first of all, actually, to work with you. And I think actually your statement on, uh, you know, that the process, uh, the shared process of editing is, uh, uh, was very inspiring. So thank you, and thank you, Marina, actually, for, uh, for having us. And of course, I'm representing here not only myself, but also Pier Vittorio Aureli, who teaches with me here in Diploma Unit 14. And uh, we wrote, of course, actually this piece together. And it's a piece that is, of course, uh, uh, kind of the result of things that we have been thinking uh, uh, and researching actually for a while now that really have to do actually with domestic labor. It's uh, research that we actually started in the unit and continued also through the work of Pier Vittorio with Dogma, so with Martino Tatara. And for the piece that actually we wrote for you and with you somehow, uh, we thought of uh, looking at the same problem of work in the house from a different perspective and actually questioning whether there is a possibility actually for a space of non-work in the house. And uh, um, the example that we found, uh, that first example actually that came to our mind, was actually to look at a culture, in fact actually two different cultures, uh, that actively despise work, which is something that for today is uh, pretty bizarre. In fact, we tend to think that actually we uh, inherited part and parcel the whole of Greco-Roman culture, you know, translated one to one to today. But in fact, actually we lost many of the guiding intellectual and cultural principles that actually shaped the Greco-Roman society. So we really thought of actually working on this idea of uh, hatred of work somehow. And this is not, the, it's like the title just of my presentation, not really of the piece, because the title of the piece was the form of ozium, so the form of the space of nothing, basically the space of non-work. And uh, uh, of course then, as I was saying before, our uh, investigation started from this very simple uh, um, you know, type of genealogy we used uh, uh, in the traditional industrial uh, city to work to live. So the idea is that actually you, know, you have to, to work basically outside of the house and then when you come back to the house, the house is a kind of haven uh, of peace and of intimacy. This is of course a complete fabrication and a complete <coughs> lie because obviously uh, it hides the, the unpaid domestic labor, obviously. But let's say that at least the intellectual let's say the cultural construct uh, really told us, uh, well, you go outside actually to toil to bring back basically money to your family in this kind of safe space that is the house. Of course, as I was saying before, this was a complete mystification of what was going on because in fact actually the house was engineered as this kind of diagram of production and reproduction that was very rigid and that still today, 150 years after Henry Roberts, we are still applying cookie cutter. So much so that, of course, uh, my generation, your generation, is the first generation that actually probably does live to work. So we see, in fact, on the contrary, that actually with this kind of diagram, uh, we have a bit of a problem because, in fact, it pigeonholes actually different activities in different rooms. And this kind of doesn't really match anymore the way we live today, which, which resembles very much the situation that Nick described before, in which actually we work from our bed, we work from our bathroom. And in fact, actually, we love to work. We have actually really learned to uh, to leave to work. So in fact, actually, the two things are completely folded onto each other. And this is a theme that I don't want to dismiss because uh, I think it's something that describes quite well actually who we are uh, as subjects. It's also a theme that as architects we have uh, explored with a few projects. Uh, most notably, one of the last projects that we did together, so myself, Black Square, with Dogma, was actually an intervention within one of the rooms at the British Pavilion in 2016, curated by Shumi, uh, Bose, and uh, Finn Williams, and Jack Self. Uh, 
And uh, actually, we were really trying to develop a model that did that did function actually for both working and living. I'm not going to enter the project. I, I just want to say that uh, I don't want to completely dismiss actually this perspective of actually melting living and working because it's very realistic in terms of who we are today. However, we are starting to see the limits, of course, of this, uh, uh, of this dynamic. Uh, and I think it was very clear in, in Nick's uh, uh, introduction. So we try to look back and we try to think if we are so, if we have this kind of Stockholm syndrome of now, you know, loving the thing that probably enslaves us, uh, and if all of our culture today, I mean, globally, is really dominated by, by work as the, almost like, you know, the, the ultimate criteria by which actually we judge things uh, in general, uh, how can we imagine other criteria that are not necessarily productive, that are about solidarity, love, play, and so on and so forth. So we look back at the Greco-Romans because the Greco-Romans uh, were very fixated on hating work and trying to reclaim life as something separate, with problems, of course, and we are going to see that in a second. So the ancient Greeks really thought that if you live, you cannot work. So there are some people between us who live, and those are wealthy uh, male that are born in the place where they live, wealthy citizens. That means like maybe 10% of the population. Anybody who is not actually born in the place where they live is already not a citizen. Of course, women don't count, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But let's say if you are one of those, uh, you cannot work. It's like it's impossible because you have to live. And living actually mean, means devoting yourself to political activity and war, perhaps. The Romans, who were much more pragmatic, uh, thought that, uh, well, work was very important for the Romans, uh, but they also felt it as a huge burden. They really thought that if you work, you can't live. So in a way, they had a kind of divide itself uh, where they recognized the importance of work and productivity, uh, but they also felt it as a huge burden and as a huge stress. So what I'd like to show you now uh, is very briefly actually four points about spaces uh, where both the Greeks and the Romans in different ways actually tried to cultivate this idea of non-work. And I have actually to make first a kind of, sorry. Yeah, you see, I'm also not able to <laughs> engage this. Um, uh, so um, I just want to br briefly show you what a Mediterranean town would have looked like uh, before the mature classical age. This is a drawing that for me is quite uh, interesting because everything that you see in black uh, is the first phase uh, of construction of this town, and everything that you see in gray is the second phase. What can we read from that? Well, that initially the houses were larger, much, much larger, and not subdivided. And then later on in time, probably around the 7th, 6th century, people started to actually uh, fragment basically these big uh, whole houses uh, that were like, you know, just one, like, one big single hall into smaller spaces that are more like purpose uh, choreographed somehow. What this meant for in terms of actually uh, leisure and work for me is very simple. Initially, actually, work, leisure, ritual, and so on and so forth were all in the same space. Uh, uh, undivided, unscripted. Uh, probably scripted through time, but not really that much through space. And at a certain moment, actually, all these different moments of human existence uh, had to start to be, thank you, choreographed in a rather different way, where every single moment of your life would have a different uh, place where you would actually carry on a certain kind of activity. So uh, you would have a space for praying and a space for sleeping, and those would not be the same space. But again, I think actually this drawing for me is actually quite meaningful because it goes to show that initially all of these activities were in the same space uh, with no subdivision. So the first point that I want to make actually about the Greeks uh, is that for the Greeks, uh, true leisure is really the highest experience of intellectual freedom. So contrary to what we think today that actually work is the realm in which actually you fulfill your intellectual uh, ambitions, for them it was exactly the opposite. It was exactly through doing nothing, through doing the things that are the least productive, that you would fulfill uh, your, your, your full potential as a human being. But of course, this came with strings attached. It came at a very high cost. It came at the cost that all the people who did not live worked, and those were 90% of the people, if not uh, more. Uh, and they were all the subjects that were marginalized, which bizarrely were actually, in fact, actually the majority of the population. Uh, how this di did this actually inform uh, domesticity in a Greek house? And I have to make here a disclaimer, the Greek uh, uh, constellation of uh, uh, settlements is very, uh, is very uh, diverse. So I'm making here like gross generalizations just for the sake of discussion. I'm just going to take a kind of standard, more or less uh, uh, Greek oikos, uh, more or less uh, from the fifth century before Christ. And you see here something quite interesting. Uh, all the different rooms uh, have kind of the same size, more or less. They are organized around a, a pretty small courtyard. 
and they are used seasonally, depending actually on environmental conditions. There's just one uh, exception, rooms A and B, so the left-hand corner and the right-hand corner at the top. And those are the two spaces uh, that we can say were truly gendered uh, and kind of purpose constructed in a Greek oikos. And room A is what w uh, was called the andron, so the space for men, and room B is what was called the ecos, so what we would say today the, the house, literally, that is in fact actually the only room that has a fire and that has water. So it's like a kitchen, we could say, but it's a kitchen come bathroom. It's like a kind of uh, uh, basically a service core, let's say. So the service core was mostly inhabited by, by women, and it served uh, for all purpose of, or purposes of like, you know, daily reproduction. But space A is actually what I'm interested in now, because actually space A is the space of absolute non-work, and it's the space that was called the Andron that was just used in a very specific occasion that was the symposium, that is basically the drinking party, um, and only for men and their paid companions, so the attire that was basically the courtesans, both uh, uh, boys and, um, and women. So, of course, true leisure then requires a space outside of the need, of need. so you don't, there's nothing that you have to do in this space, let's say, but also outside of ritual, because in a way, ritual is also scripted, so it's not completely free, which means that for the Greeks, uh, sport and theater and entertainment uh, were not leisure, because they were not completely, in a way, uh, freed uh, from the rules of ritual. But on the contrary, what for them was, uh, in fact, uh, uh, sorry, what for them was, uh, um, in fact, uh, um, completely free, I mean, what was uh, leisure time, was drinking, again, not eating, because you need to eat to survive, but you don't really need to drink alcohol to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, no reproductive sex and poetry, because also poetry is uh, something that is essentially useless. And, uh, um, and I think it's actually really interesting to look at these spaces. Uh, these spaces were usually in a corner of the house, they were normally actually expressed also to the outside, uh, so towards the street uh, with a different type of cladding. Uh, so there would also be a, some kind of status symbol that you would see from outside. And then inside there would be fixed furniture, like a bench running around uh, the whole uh, room. So that's how we recognize them that actually in archaeological digs. And the, the last detail that I always found really so funny and interesting is it's the, pretty much the only uh, room in the house that has a really, really heavy door. And we can tell this actually from the hinges. So it means that actually it's basically the only room in the house that you can truly lock. And that means that you can lock yourself in, not that you lock it from outside. Meaning that uh, we really construct a kind of bubble that is completely outside of the realm of domesticity and it's uh, really there for, uh, for the purpose of actually allowing uh, the, the male, the male uh, uh, of, like the male head of the house and his guests uh, to enjoy this complete bubble of nothingness. Now, the thing that I think is amazing about this space is that it's a space of pure uh, hedonism somehow, but at the same time, it's the place where Greek politics actually were born. It's the place actually where Greek poetry was born. And it's the place where pretty much any important uh, invention in terms of actually philosophy, poetry, politics, and so on and so forth, they were not really born in the Agora, they were born in here. They were born, uh, you know, during uh, uh, moments of sexual play, of, uh, uh, you know, listening to music, uh, uh, playing around with poetry, and of course being deadly serious actually in the moment of having fun. And then if we have to move to how um, their neighbors, actually the Romans, uh, saw uh, the problem of leisure and work, they had a slightly different actually point of view on that. Because the problem is uh, uh, that the Roman house, contrary to the Greek house, uh, is really seen as a social space. It's open at all times of the day, people come and go. So for them, really, the personal, for the Romans, the personal was social. And then also leisure became productive. Uh, which means that, in fact, actually, we don't have any moment of interruption in the house that resembles, actually, uh, the symposium or the andron in Greek culture. Um, so it means that also the whole house becomes productive, that we don't have this kind of uh, resting space uh, anymore. And I just want to show you one example of one such uh, uh, domus. Uh, we can find, actually, in this plan, a space uh, that hosts uh, also evening parties. Uh, is the G space uh, top right, basically, the, the uh, big room uh, on the courtyard, uh, on the second courtyard, on the garden. Uh, but this is a very different space, actually, from the Andron. It's a space where, first of all, they do eat in there, so it's not only the, the superfluous nature of alcohol, but it's you know proper place where you can have banquets. It's a space for both genders. 
Um, and it's especially a space uh, for uh, social, social representation, I would say. So uh, from this point of view, it's completely uh, embedded in the realm of need, or what the Greeks would say is the realm of need, because it's political, it's commercial, it's, it's, it's explicitly about networking, I would say, in, with using like a contemporary term, which means that you are not really going to go in there to relax. You can kind of have fun, but it's always going to be somehow a productive extension of your social life, let's say. Um, so, of course, then, uh, if we look at the evolution of this space of the domus, we can say that, funnily enough, in this very, very scripted environment, in this very social, intense environment that the Romans actually had in their houses, uh, revolution really began uh, in the space uh, that, that I would call it opaque space uh, of solitude, so in the space of doing nothing. And there was such a space. Uh, the space was the cubiculum, so that is actually the space where the Romans would go to sleep. There was an extremely reduced uh, sleeping pod, I would call it, uh, that pretty much only has a space for a bed. Uh, there is no window, actually, in this cubicula, so they are clearly extremely functional spaces where you just go to drop at the end of the day, and uh, maybe not even really for sexual intimacy, in fact, actually. Most of these beds were quite small. So these spaces were sometimes actually uh, beautifully decorated, but they were always uh, uh, tiny, even actually in the, in the wealthiest houses. That meant that actually that was the only place where you could find, in fact, actually respite from this super intense social life. And that meant that, in fact, actually these were the first places uh, where the Christian religion was actually practiced within these domuses. Domi, anyway, however <laughs> the plural is. So that meant that actually from within, you have actually the very revolution that broke apart the Roman Empire was uh, pretty much actually started in a bedroom, started actually from this space, uh, extremely constrained space where you would uh, be able to be in there alone and pray, essentially. That's also then not a surprise that then this space would become the blueprint for the monastic cell and would be translated one to one. So we found that actually it was very interesting for us uh, in this second example, especially in the case of the, of the Romans, the fact that actually something uh, that was uh, in fact initially part of a very rigid apparatus uh, was uh, misinterpreted or was hijacked or was appropriated, let's say, uh, by the Christians uh, to break down this order from within. And uh, we thought that that was interesting for us uh, because if we feel so constrained by contemporary apartments uh, that are very much the diagram that I showed you at, at the beginning, uh, maybe it's not a question of inventing necessarily uh, new types, but it's a question of first uh, challenging and deconstructing actually the typologies that we have from within. And why we, one way of challenging, challenging them, of course, could come from challenging the very idea of work and productivity. So. I would say that actually, you know, what the Greek can teach us if they have anything to teach is that doing nothing uh, is a form of freedom. But also what the Romans actually can teach us is that perhaps doing nothing uh, can be a form of agency. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, so as you see there, are, uh, with these two conversations, we wanted to address the idea of forced labor and automation in a particular fashion, a different way, because there are many talks about automation and the possibilities of non-work, not working, uh, but most of the times, leisure or this doing nothing is uh, at the expense of the work and exploitation of, of others. Um, so as using your maybe methodology of time travel as a historical method, we wanted to bring different stories, not only for the, from the here and now, but also other type of stories into the conversation in order to maybe make this conversation about automation a bit uh, research and maybe to uh, instigate some friction. With this, I want to invite uh, Director Frank uh, to, <laughs> to respond to, to the presentations and, uh, and maybe to share your thoughts about these themes. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for bringing your book, your ideas, and, and this conversation into the lecture hall. Um, strangely enough, I, I felt different forms of violence throughout your presentations. Uh, responding maybe to the premise of, um, of the book, nor of the work, in which you don't attempt to necessarily have a dialectical conversation or an oppositional one, but actually an assembly of certain issues that are addressed one after the other, hoping that something might emerge as a kind of an editorial voice that is not necessarily understood as a whole, but as a, as a, as a series of, of maybe footnotes, no, of a story that is undergoing that we as contemporary agents can just punctuate. Um, it was very um, difficult actually for me to uh, go from the 
constant new hands on the idea of labor and uh, the idea of play and how actually one can start rendering or registering the landscapes right now constitute the Dutch landscape, no? And that the space of, uh, uh, of transactional and at the same time global domination through a form of optimization of, of production and distribution um, and then immediately jump, no? Into into something that is as, as, as hard and as difficult, if you want, as the, as the crisis of migration and the violence that is happening in a, geo, uh, uh, in a global uh, geopolitical context. Um, and it made me think, in relationship to both of your presentations, and we, I'm, I'm, I have a few questions, no? and I will try to make a bit of a summary, and then I will try to be precise. It's, it's something that has to do who has, and we mentioned this last week, who has the right to speak on behalf of who, yeah? Because, of course, you're speaking in, in behalf of something that no one really can claim authorship, no? And something that is within Western culture, we can really talk about it. But Ayesha, I felt that if instead of you were talking about, about uh, this kind of anthropocentric Drexeia, uh, uh, there was someone else speaking with that kind of extreme poetic and aesthetic violence on relationship to that subject. I think we all would have felt that something was extremely wrong, right? And I think that really made me reflect about what is that that we are doing when we are putting those subjects on the table with the kind of uh, generosity and violence that at the same time research and artistic practice require and demand. And of course, that brings me back to the moment in which, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Nick, you were taking us through that kind of journey, you know, those spaces of prostitution, slavery, and labor that only became almost okay. You know, it was almost all right at the very last closing comment when suddenly the emergency button of the uh, 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 room of that uh, prostitute uh, working was uh, uh, equal to that chicken cooking machine, you no? Know? And that, in fact, all these technologies seen as notions of progress are, in fact, just enslaving us independently if something looks as benign as a kitchen or as problematic or as questionable as a, as a brother room. But beyond that kind of reflection that might, be very, might seem very obvious, the question is what is that that we are doing in terms of like changing the idea of reflection, critique versus agency, no? And so it seems to me that there is a lot of like reflection and maybe some critique embedded, but where do we actually find ourselves the leverage to act in the design or transformation of some of those conditions or circumstances that surround us. Um, and, and of course, with, with Maria's presentation, no, the way in which we, I mean, I always like to uh, fantasize no, and, and about how do we construct those new canonical histories? How do we rewrite that history in a way that allows us to, to be more powerful no, and to create new uh, discourses? And, of course, we all inherited the fact that the Agora was the place where democracy was invented. I mean, who was there to register that space? And I love the fact that you are shifting, right? That kind of like so well-known narrative, uh, doing what Ayesha uh, mentioned, not this kind of like time travel as a method for exploration and uh, historical research, and to try to give us another narrative where in fact, we don't necessarily care. This is what is interesting is that we might not necessarily care about what is that that is being delivered to us as a kind of a certain idea of truth necessarily, as long as that actually arms us to act and to produce an entire new set of spatial, social, political articulations that might be able to really uh, 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 allow us to act into some of the things that we consider are not good enough, that are wrong. Um, and so one of the questions here, uh, looking into, a, a, I would like to think, um, I mean, we are not that new, but I would like to think it's a new generation uh, of, of, of practici practitioners, editors, writers, artists. Um, how do we position ourselves? And this is a larger question. How do we position ourselves beyond the editorial project of just putting things one next to each other, uh, difficult subjects and, and contemporary subjects between technology and the body uh, to really try to, to start acting? And, and how, how far are we willing to, to reach, and that obviously that's a question that goes into the, uh, into the creator, into the initiator of this project, as someone who does that work constantly as part of a cultural institution. But um, again, like my stomach was getting closed and closed and closed and closed throughout the presentations, and then I've been open and then closed, no? And, and, and that's a very strange feeling that we ourselves, um, we need to understand where is our agency, no? I understand the space of reflection, I, I understand the space of critique, 
but where is our agency? Where does the agency of, of, of this project reside? It's a very important question. I think in that sense, the book, as Nick was saying, is a weird creature because it doesn't necessarily include all the voices that are in the pavilion. And we try to do an experiment that is bringing these more long uh, theoretical essays together with shorter uh, reflections that are, we call the kind of image essays that are almost like images and captions. And we invite that primarily practitioners to reflect on contemporary spaces and how they address these questions from a more, I will say, um, instrumental uh, approach. Um, so we try to bring these notions uh, together and uh, that was a, a for, uh, kind of a form of departure to understand how these narr narratives could infiltrate the uh, practice as well. Obviously, it's not the only, only way, um, but for us, it was an attempt to bring this conversation, these themes together the conversation about innovation and technology that many times are very devoid of critical perspective. So what we have tried to do is uh, bring these notions and these themes into the space of the school of the architecture to question these technologies, not only embrace them, but also understand uh, which other lineages and histories they, they belong to and they are connected, but also to the space of practice to invite architects and designers to look into the spaces of automation that most of the times are not designed by architects. So invite them to see and learn from these spaces and see uh, you know, how they are occupying larger parts of the territory and affecting the way in which we live in, in the space. And yet, most of the time, we are not part of these processes. And finally, also through policy making. So one of the questions was being in the Dutch pavilion, obviously there is a official representation of a country and many officials are participating in the conversation. So trying to, you know, make a whole, whole country reflect on beyond the optimism that these technologies bring how you can reflect on how these practices are connected to former histories of the country, maybe like through the slave trade and others, like to see, to be very, uh, you know, harsh perhaps about maybe the wealth that allows for these technologies to be implemented uh, where they come from. So, and obviously I like your project, like your questions about the, if, if we can talk on behalf of others, I think it's inevitable in this project because we are told all the time talking about, about otherness. And it starts with the idea of positioning the robot as the other. And what we try to explain or like maybe not explain, but bring together in this book is that the other is the robot, but the other is the woman, the other is the migrant, the other is the slave body. The, so what uh, over history we have positioned as the other has been changing over time. So perhaps the way in which we imagine that robotic bodies or mechanic bodies will operate as for us to create a laser uh, driven architecture space. Well, we have to see that perhaps this also setting the, um, the stage or setting the boundaries or, or the conditions for a series of exploitative practices that have been ongoing uh, through history. No, I mean, I think that that's, <clears throat> I mean, the idea of, of, of this other, no? And like, when we talk about we, the other, like we use we a lot these days, no? It's like, because we and someone asks, who is we? And I said, we is always the other, right? We is never us, we is always that other. But um, Ayesha, m maybe there was something that, of course, there is this urgent, need to, um, to produce those sanctuaries and at the same time to unveil uh, those histories. And that is a history that is well known, that is reported, but is never known enough, no? That is never reported enough. And I think maybe for me what would be interesting is like, this is an ongoing project that probably you have been working for many years now. And I would like to learn a bit more uh, where somehow it started and maybe that, that could be an entire lecture itself. But where do, see, where do you see it going? Like where would you like to see it really moving towards, because I think that that's really for me, in a certain way, I, I like to move maybe today this conversation from that space of reflection and understanding towards this uh, space of action. I found extremely beautiful, no, that kind of oniric fictional construction um, in which suddenly the, the anger is transforming to almost a kind of a, um, 
fairy tale, no? In, in which suddenly, like, and how does one take then that, that power, no? That beautiful color of the sea and transform it into that uh, force that you want to have. So um, I don't know, where, where are you taking this project? Where is the next uh, step? Oh, I was, I was getting ready to talk about who speaks for whom, so I'm going <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> to have to switch that. gears a bit. I mean, I mean for me, um, my interests have been uh, quite long-standing in the Middle Passage, as well as uh, doing uh, organizing work with illegalized migrants from when I lived in Canada. And to me, there was an analogy to be made that um, could only be flattened if that analogy was made too directly. So to sort of to think through the Middle Passage and think through the Mediterranean um, as somehow being in conversation, but not making one a metaphor for the other or anything like that. So for me, when I discovered Drexia, um, that became a very interesting way to sort of think about uh, just the mode of speculation as producing certain kinds of connections um, that that um, that um, that don't get flattened out because you're in the mode of speculation. Um, but that said, I mean, I think that the, the, the project is to sort of try to think through what is, is sort of enabled at that level of removed. Um, um, but I think it's also, I think there's a kind of ethical component as well, because you can't only stay in the mode of, um, of, of the speculative, and you can't always do these meta lines. So I think for me, the future, the future of the project really is to, to find ways of staying with this hypothetical, drawing these kind of very, um, sort of tenuous lines, I would say, between two moments, and then finding a way to ground it on Earth. So actually this film that I made uh, is actually a collaborative film that I made with Hamadine Kane. And one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about who speaks for whom, um, so I'm gonna bring it back to that, is to sort of think about, about that, because if he was in the room, we would be framing it together quite differently, and I don't really like to speak for him, but then there's a way in which one has to sort of narrate the, the genesis of the film. So Hamadin um, actually lives in Brussels um, and has a refugee passport and uh, arrived from Senegal by walking uh, to the northern coast. Um, and so when we made this film together, we made it, we just had a, a fantastic conversation. Um, but a part of the, the film is actually grounded in sort of finding a meeting ground between what I was interested in, what he was interested in, in the very vast terrain of what migration is on the Mediterranean. Um, but for him, so he's a practicing artist and he, he travels well, and for him to speak about his role or his, his history as a, as a refugee uh, is a kind of act of agency. But for me to speak of it with, in my position isn't, and that, that's a co-optation, so I always hover between. Do you feel that you need to have, that you need to collaborate with someone who actually is a, had a first-hand experience, or do we as artists and architects carry the responsibility as part of our role mm -hmm. to actually be able to speak on behalf of others? I think, I think, I think it hovers between the two. I think, I think both are equally important. To me, the story of this ghost ship, um, which, hap which sort of sailed in 2006, I only heard about it when I was in doing uh, research in Barbados. Uh, and it's a story that I think should be more known. So that I did, I did want to sort of, uh, talk about that story, um, uh, but, but on the other hand, to be honest, we were paired up for the biennial, and I, it was a beautiful thing because I think there's a way in which one works, and then if you come into contact with someone who works very differently with a very different set of vocabularies, then something third gets made. Yeah. So I, but I think it's, I think it's absolutely, but I think also the, the the danger of speaking for is something that we should be very very aware of throughout and. You're always on the cusp of, of failure, I think, yeah. quite honestly. Yeah. I mean, as an editor, Nick, one always, I mean, it was beautiful what you said at the beginning, right? That sometimes an editor doesn't do much except that one makes things certain happen. Uh, um, maybe I can disclose right now that the first person that ever read my statement <laughs> for the directorship application for this school was Nick. Uh, and, and I think you changed two words and put an S. Uh, uh. <laughs> I, I had to let you speak. Right? <laughs> and, and so, but, but, but I think that's a very important aspect, no? when you put people together and you let them speak. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the question and the difficult one is to put people that otherwise would never come together, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And when you put ideas that would never come together, mm -hmm. and the danger no, uh, uh, of doing that as a curator, as editor, or as a commissioner. Um, and I think that 
I mean, throughout your presentation, no, jumping from uh, from one bed to then like from like someone else's research to your own research to some ideas to other ideas. Um, the idea is not only uh, in terms of advocacy, no, it is in terms of ideas. How do we we have a right to a point in which um, the idea of authorship and and in terms of uh, original research versus uh, I mean ideas of plagiarism, ideas of authenticity, even in architecture and design. I think it's a very interesting phenomenon, and um, as someone who constantly has to deal with ideas of others that then actually are being positioned and, and, and related with a, its own history or other histories, I'm very interested in, 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 in a topic that is not necessarily about work, body, or leisure, but it has to do a lot more with, with the, the work that you guys do. No? When do you encounter an idea or a work? And maybe that's something that things that might not have made into the book or things that actually, when you say, the idea is good, but it's not good enough. Or this idea has not been cooked enough, but is, is violent enough. Because there was something about your presentation that made me think about, at some point we were in the society of, uh, society of the spectacle, no? And then I was just like, I was thinking like violence is a spectacle, this equality is a spectacle. Like there was an spectacularization of the ideas that you were presenting that, that I think there is a real editorial uh, hand in there. And I would like to hear a bit more about what do you leave in and what do you leave out? Yeah, um, so when I, when I tend to, let's say when I do some design practices or when I, when I uh, make images, um, it's always grounded in cartography. Um, and I think, you know, when, when I started this discussion with Marina or, or when we, when we uh, you know, when I was approached to, to work on this, um, we had a discussion that was trying to take these, it, the, these ideas that we might have had about these concepts and, and find their limits, or at least find our limits with them. Um, and so we, we kind of opened up a terrain, uh, I think, within ourselves and an understanding of what this project could be. Um, and from there, you know, we, we kind of started populating. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't, you know, I don't know, I, maybe we wanted something like an even covering of the field, something like this. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think what, what, we were, what we were trying to do is to position things that were not too close um, and that were not too distant. Mm -hmm. So that you know, we might be able, because I, I think something, I mean, if we think of this book as, as a map, as a cartography, I mean, it doesn't make sense to put two points, one on top of each yeah. other. Um, at least in this kind of horizontal uh, approach of, of a map that we can think of. But at the same time, um, I think that there, uh, you know, we wanted to make sure that there was, you know, we wanted to make sure that, that things were not too close, but we, so we wanted to make sure they were far enough, I guess. You know, I think, you know, we can look at maybe Benjamin Bratton's idea of the stack of like a vertical cartography mm -hmm. of, of, um, of the city. Uh, you know, I think what we were trying to do is create a three-dimensional space um, where you can start to to identify different sites. I mean, also to speak to your to your first question of intervention um, of agency, different scales, um, and so you know exactly how we um, you know we we decided you know what fell in and what fell out. Um, I think it was. Uh, you know, for example, we, we wanted diversity in terms of the, the, the manner of approaching topics. Like we didn't, we wanted some more uh, lengthy academic scholarly texts. We wanted others that were more fictional, that were more, um, that were more, um, that were more poetic. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, 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 I feel uncomfortable invoking this term, but I'm going to, because it's not entirely intuitive. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think it is about kind of understanding and tuning yourself to uh, the nature of the project that you're working with, which I think was, um, even though I, it, it, was, it was frustrating at times, but you know, having these kind of three terms was really useful for that. So it was always about kind of sensing the limits and sensing the proximity and distance between things. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's a question about, uh, yeah, I totally agree with Nick, uh, about authorship, because I think it's very important. Um, so I was working before in a, an academic institution in, at Columbia, and obviously I was very much aware of, you know, this, how to use uh, sources, how to quote someone, and, and so on. And, and then within the academic world, very much this authorship 
is very uh, connected to, you know, the intellectual the work. I work in a in a public institution that is connected to, you know, the government, who so mediates between the field, uh, theory, um, and the government. So, in a way, my role is to instigate certain debates. And many times I've been, uh, you know, in these conversations, like who is the owner of the conversation on automation? Who is the owner of the conversation on work and leisure? It has been done before, or it will be done uh, again. I honestly don't care. Uh, my role is to make sure that these conversations happen and to find different people to bring together and to, to have these conversations. I don't think I should have any, and I always say that, to claim an authorship on this conversation or to claim a kind of, uh, yeah, ownership on it. I just assemble, maybe it's the way of editorial and curatorial work, um, people who actually has much more knowledge than I have, and they can share it. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, idea because um, many people feel very threatened by this type of, of works. And uh, I continuously see people saying, I, I cannot do this in this biennial because you did that uh, already, this theme was like, well, but this is to advance the conversation. So why, let's copy each other. Like, I mean, I, 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 I refer the work of other people, but I make, make sure that I, I use their names, I, I, I mention them. But at the same time, let's appropriate the ideas of others and, and advance them. I think otherwise is, we are just wasting, our, wasting the time. I mean, and I'm saying this because I think your work in many ways is always collaborative in nature. Yeah. And while we all understand the value and importance of recognizing authorship and the intellectual property that goes associated to business models and forms of livelihood, there is also a kind of detrimental aspect to it that actually uh, positions a kind of new map of, of, of geopolitics of ideas that one might not want to enter. There was a thought that actually, uh, Maria, while you were talking, what I love about I don't know, that kind of historiographical work or fictional work, because I think at the end of the day probably it doesn't, doesn't really matter, yeah. is that um, how do we, how do we, and it goes back into agency, no? And like, so whoever figured some of those things out and realized that the elites uh, doing nothing, no, were in fact the ones that, that uh, were in power, uh, somehow managed in like 2,000 years to glorify the, the glorification of work as the mechanism for actually the democratization of society, because now everyone, right, even like everyone is working, right? Even the kind of supposedly like the, the elites are also working. Even when they are not working, they still want to work. And because it's either, it's through, they work through social media, everything. And, and so if one tries to think of a perverse mode of how do we democratize societies by actually transforming work into something glorified, and now we're actually arriving to the point in which suddenly so much people is working that we need to actually go back to the uh, universal income and that in fact working will be a luxury because that's the way in which we know. And so that there is a kind of like dystopic uh, a, a horizon in which suddenly work will be the, the highest privilege to be able to do the things that you really want to do or even to just do something at all. And so, um, Reading that into uh, spatial uh, conditions, no, I think the, then the question goes into, into one that I think also affects very much uh, this building and the kind of pedagogical uh, 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 and underlining uh, of, of this uh, space that we are also made of small rooms. No, we hardly have this main lecture hall in which we can feel that forum, that is not a forum, that ulti ultimately is a theater, no? It's like that theater of performance. And so in this kind of like, um, kind of quest of identifying spaces and saying maybe more or less, less of that, no? There is one of the students in and actually another unit that is not yours that is looking into the uh, into this fashionable atrium, no? That in all these collective working spaces is appearing as the kind of new cool space that is is the kind of uh, symbol or sign of the of the precariat, no? And, and so I'm very interested because you're translating your ideas always directly into architectural and spatial conditions. And so um, if, if, if now we are going towards this total glorification of work into which actually managed to democratize action, like, are we just making an, an entire society of rooms? I mean, I would just like to keep you talking a bit more, but uh, in the same way that I ask Asha, is like, wh where is this research and this work going? Like, where, where are you going, especially? Absolutely. I think that it's, it's a really great question that for me has two sides to it. One that has more to do with this storytelling, if you want, that exactly as you said, up to a certain degree, it doesn't, doesn't even matter whether it's true or not. 
of course, I mean, we try to be as rigorous as possible, but that's somehow beside the point. Um, and so that's one question. And then the second question is more typological, I would say, really architectural. And if we go back to the first question of actually the storytelling, for me, what was really interesting of this uh, uh, occasion that actually Marina and Nick gave us uh, is that as uh, uh, essentially as a feminist, uh, the subject that I, that I really scrutinize in most of what I do is the woman. But then I always thought that one of the most beautiful things about feminism is that that's, it's as much about liberating men as it's about liberating women. And uh, so both the narrative of the cubiculum and of the Andron are really very much about uh, the male subject. Mm -hmm. And sometimes also about, also about the non-standard male subject and, and about the queer subject, for instance, uh, which is very important, particularly in the Andron. So um, in a way, that's in terms of storytelling, uh, what I wish for myself is, uh, first of all, to, to have this kind of uh, feminism in the expanded field somehow that is going to somehow, uh, yeah, maybe they colonize men as well because, I mean, they, they deserve it as much as uh, women. And I think that also means a little bit maybe uh, be betraying or like going beyond uh, uh, my or our, uh, mine at least for sure, uh, Marxist background because, of course, the Marxist background is all about production and it's all about work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that maybe it it's as much as that has been useful, it's about really constructing new narratives uh, that go against uh, this big narrative that most uh, left-wing uh, progressive thought uh, has been, I don't want to say poisoned by, but definitely informed by. And I think that maybe if we start to shift uh, in a way the, the focus, maybe we are not going to bang our head against the wall about reproductive labor and the woman enslaved in the house, which are all things that are very much true and they are very much at the core of my work, but maybe now, the way I'm trying to think about it now is how about shifting the perspective and also seeing that also men needs to be liberated just as much as the woman. Typologically, I think that this is a huge question. Um, for architecturally, let's say, especially for a long time, I thought, and in part, I'm still convinced, and I'm going to give a very, very simple answer, that just uh, doing the spaces that are non-scripted and me, uh, that, uh, that might be also over-dimensioned, let's say, useless spaces, uh, might be almost all right. Uh, Lakaton and Vassal have done it in many projects, so it's just random, no, I don't want to say random, but let's say extra space. So in a way, uh, pushing the user in a position where they have to make up their own script because there is essentially no predetermined agenda. That is like the most basic answer that I can give, and we've been working for, on that for quite a few years now, so I do have a question also with myself whether there are other ways uh, to um, to break down uh, actually the the logic with which we design today that are not simply well let's make uh, vaguer spaces that are bigger. I still think that that's not a bad answer, but I'm not sure that it's uh, the only answer that we can have. And going back to the question of rooms that you were saying, uh, yes, I think. Uh, uh, that sounds like a really interesting idea. So to, to conceive maybe not of buildings, uh, but of the city as rooms uh, somehow, and maybe actually rearticulate them in a different way um, could be interesting because we would be forced actually to rejig actually the meaning of what these rooms are and so on and so forth. But to be honest, I think that this for me is the one design question today, especially for people who design domestic space, let's say, and office space, which by the way today, can we really tell actually what's the difference? Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. so sure. Uh, but uh, there's definitely a big question as designers, uh, uh, as designers there for which uh, if anybody has the answer, please stand up. Actually, it would be great also, you know, to open the, the conversation also to the, to the audience. But uh, our very, very provisional answer was uh, uh, to go in that direction of making less scripted spaces uh, and making, uh, um, yeah, spaces that are overabundant so that you can reinterpret it. But what we were trying to do actually with this uh, in little investigation here was also, and we don't have an answer yet, to do the opposite. So to say, okay, let's not change the diagram. Let's just change the way we use the diagram. Uh, because that's actually what the Romans did. I mean, what, what the early Christians really did, in fact, actually. I mean, they used, they didn't change anything. They just used things differently all of a sudden. And that's why, I, actually, I think for me, it's almost like a kind of uh, uh, virtuous circle because uh, I have the feeling that m big question to our quest for a new typology that is going to respond to our way of living maybe really lies in the storytelling more than the design. And that's why I think pieces like yours, Aisha, are so, are so important because they are really, you know, those moments in which actually we start to think about things uh, uh, differently. And, and, they, and it, I have to say it's weird coming from me because I'm really like a designer's designer, uh, but I'm starting to think that maybe it's more important first uh, 
to, to change the narrative, to change the words that we use uh, or, or change the way we use certain words, let's say, um, rather than trying to find a typological fix immediately. I mean, or that's interesting not. because um, you use um, the sentence, we don't change the space, we just change the diagram, yeah. right? And the diagram stands for, in some ways, not only function, but also for all the possible things mm -hmm. yeah. that that diagram uh, might represent, that is questions of ownership, time, money. Um, I don't think it is time for questions and, and for opening up to the, uh, to the, to the floor. Um, Silvia. Um, I have um, two, two questions. Well, one's, yeah, two questions. Uh, the first is for you. Um, so at, at, at the very beginning, you said fairly emphatically, uh, this is not a catalog, this is a book. Yep. And so like that, the fact that you were so emphatic about that really stuck. But then following, I haven't actually seen the publication and I haven't seen the, <laughs> okay, so I will. Yeah. Um, the book is here if anyone wants to take a look or get one. Okay, yeah. and, then, and then I can take the question away. Um, but so based on kind of what's been presented and the discussions, you know, when you were saying earlier, I kind of, I don't care if someone copies the ideas or builds off of the ideas. Everything that you're saying and presenting to me really seems like a catalog. So I'm very curious. And, and for me, book has a very specific meaning. So I'm curious, maybe what, what was the thinking behind you saying that so emphatically and really like you don't want anyone to misunderstand. Guys, this is not a catalog. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, I mean, there's, there are no photographs. There's nothing that you would see in the exhibition in the book. Um, the book was conceived of as, so actually the, the Work Body Leisure Project, if, if I may speak kind of on behalf of it, it's, it's, it's seen not just as an exhibition, it's seen more as a curatorial project that manifests in different forms. Mm -hmm. So the book was seen as one instance of the project. The exhibition similarly was one instance of the project. Um, there were a series of, of events and public programs that was also one instance. So, you know, while we do, we, we did invite, um, actually required all of the uh, contributors, the main contributors to the pavilion to contribute with an essay, what you will find, like the, what they contributed was very different. Um, so for example, um, you know, Beatrice Colomina, I mean, she recreated the, the Hilton suite of the bed in for peace, but you're present in the exhibition itself, you're presented with just the recreation. There's not really like a historical, um, you know, backing to that, but there's also not directly, a, a, let's say that the, the, the context of ideas that you can situate it in relation to is not as full. Um, so while it, it shares some content, mm -hmm. um, it also adds an enormous amount more. Um, it is not a documentation. Um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is an instance of, of a wider project. Um, yeah, and it's like a very briefly that also I think um, even if you share uh, methodologies in editing and curating, uh, the spatial component of the book or the exhibition allow for interaction, spatial interactions and proximities and distances that are different. So there are certain narratives that come across in the pavilion that are not present in the book and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there is like, in a way, there could be two different projects that share certain ideas. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's uh, so important to say this is not a catalog, no, but, but uh, the, the, the depends on what you imagine for, like, depends on what you define as book. I'm curious because you seem to have a very particular idea. I don't have a particular idea for what an exhibition is, and I think that's what I enjoy, that yeah. every project for me as an exhibition, uh, we start from zero to define what it is, and the same with a book. So I'm curious about what you no, no, describe well, that. The, the, the reason that I asked that, and, I, and, and like I was just intrigued by it is, it, for me, essentially, a book is just a space. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, it's a blank canvas. Mm -hmm. So to so, and, and a catalog is a subcategory of a book. So to specifically deny the subcategory, but not identify, but like just bring us back to like the mothership, mm -hmm. I didn't get what was going on, and I was just, 
It's, it's just what happens to anyone who has done a national pavilion. You want to make sure you don't do a catalog. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, I mean, it's like once you go through that, you will actually know that. Because I have, like... You have done three, I, three uh, books. They are not catalogs. But exactly, yeah. <laughs> three books. <laughs> so it, it, I think your question is very good and very, yeah. very relevant because it has to do with what things are not, no? And, but what things can be. Exactly. And, and I think that that's a, a very important question because is it... As, as, uh, we spent last year looking very much into how does one produce a taxonomy of books between the idea of the monograph or the idea of the uh, 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 atlas or the uh, uh, geography of essays. Like, how does one categorize this kind of contemporary form of books that emerge from a specific exhibitions that are not, they don't want to be categorized as catalogs, right? <laughs> because you will be careful when it will arrive to any library go after later on into the metadata, and you will see in the bag that it will say catalog of the exhibition, yeah. right? Yeah. And so as much as you want to claim that it is not, in fact, it is. Yeah. And it is going to be registered as such. And so then the question is, I mean, I think you have just opened up an entire other Pandora box. <laughs> <laughs> this actually might require an entire different event that it has to do with, um, what's the problem with exhibition catalogs? Maybe I, I just bring back the table to the question to Nick, because what's the problem with exhibition catalogs? Or maybe, Aisha, you have done enough ca exhibition catalogs. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know who wants to take the question, but I think it's a very good question. Yeah, I don't know. I, for me, it's, uh, it, it maybe is kind of a semantic thing where, where there are certain um, assumptions that we have of a catalog that it is representational of, um, of something that, that happened in a space. So you will go and you will see photographs. So I think the catalog serves as um, a representation for the, the, the exhibition when you can't, when you yeah. couldn't have gone. And I think this is not meant to be like, uh, so I, but I, yeah. I think that. So I, I guess it's, I, it's not that, ex that catalogs don't have a purpose. Yeah. Um, I just think that's not what we made. Like if we really wanted to create a catalog that would have represented the exhibition yeah. in printed form, it would have been a very different. No, no, I, and I think I'm starting to understand now, and partly the reason that I am fixating on this is like, because I fundamentally think that words are incredibly important. And in, um, when you were saying whether it's a matter of uh, redesigning the typologies or re redesigning the narrative, mm -hmm. and for me, it, it's so much about the narrative and the choice of words. And mm -hmm. so, so, for, while I can understand, while I can understand the desire to not be the catalog, for, for me, it's pr like prejudices, ideas, spaces are created through our commitment to one word or another, um, and and therefore, if it is a, the as as a kind of full believer in the construction of of narrative over production, if we kind of link it back to the production. Um, yeah, I just I would just say then then book is not a good enough word because book is just uh, it it's a generic it, it mm. it's a space filler it doesn't actually mean anything it's a space mm. um, just um, as a thought. Th there was one thing I was thinking about. Um, well, not not about the re relationship between book and catalog, but maybe about the idea of how different forms sort of convey their own sort of narratives. I mean, my own project has that. I mean, retrograde futurism, this, what I showed a film clip of, has three very different lives, one in the book um, mm -hmm. and one as a performance. And I would say all of them have a starting point of a certain narrative, mm -hmm. um, but they, one isn't reducible to the other. And, you know, mm -hmm. as an academic, you know, the, the written part is the most privileged in, in terms of refs and things like right. that. But I would say that it's not an illustration of it, it's not a documentation mm -hmm. of the other things. I think what a catalog might be in that instance is a documentation of the exhibition itself. Whereas if you have a larger project, um, it could just take on different iterations and each iteration will convey something about the larger project that the other forms can't. Um, uh, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a similar thing, right? With the, yeah. with this in a, in a, yeah. To be very honest, I think uh, the, that like the national pavilions are very like difficult, uh, you know, dynamics. You no, know, you have to respond to certain conditions. So even if we are extremely proud of the work we did, I will say that the book allow us a space of freedom 
uh, that was much more complicated to address in the pavilion. For instance, Ayer Shao Maria were not present, their walls were not present in the pavilion. Um, so I think that uh, it was much more playful the way in which we addressed, even that the pavilion was quite playful, but I think the, the conversation with Nick allowed for another conversation. Um, so I'm, in that sense, I'm very grateful to, to Nick to, to take the project to another, another dimension, another yeah, yeah. level. Um, I kind of wanted to pick up on something you talked about, about how you conceived of the book as a kind of mixture between these longer texts and then these shorter photo essays. And you said um, that they were a way to test how practitioners could instrumentalize some of these ideas. Um, I guess in the very recent past, yesterday, I had to chair a very charged discussion between um, an architect who was trying to instrumentalize an idea and a critical theorist who was framing the kind of bigger picture within which that idea happened. And it was really interesting. I mean, it became quite oppositional, which was interesting and fun. Um, but I think, uh, in a way, I think both of them could have learned a lot from each other. And I'm just quite curious. I think it's a great setup for a publication. But I'm curious as to like, how does this project continue? And um, maybe what are the forms of conversation that could exist between these practitioners who are testing these ideas and then the kind of academic essays that are kind of framing, or time tra I love the idea of time traveling as a form of research, that are kind of framing it within a kind of longer lineage. Is it through kind of setting up more conversations like this that bring those different types of people together to talk about some of these ideas? Or I know that the, you were saying earlier that the exhibition is now in Rotterdam. So uh, is it an, as it continues, as I think Aisha, you were saying earlier that in each text that you write, it kind of changes the project or the project develops a bit. So I'm just curious as to how this bigger project of work, body, leisure will continue to evolve. I can read briefly, but um, I think if you, you see the, the different contributions of the book, you will be clearly identify two type of voices or languages. I mean, very, uh, in very blunt. And the practitioners have a particular approach uh, that is uh, very optimistic, I will say, in the relation to, <laughs> uh, to the possibilities of design, whereas maybe in other essays that's not the case. It's more like what we have seen today, a bit more critical approach and so on. So these two worlds, that's what I was saying, is a weird creature because sometimes they seem to go to in a completely different uh, dimension. The interesting part is that by being collected in that particular space, suddenly they have they have read the book, they have uh, participated in different conversations and there might be certain, uh, certain you know, assemblages uh, that will happen. And in many cases, uh, architectural offices that are, they were designing work spaces without being part of these conversations. Now, they, you know, they, they tell that having these, these discussions allow them to reflect on their work in a different way. I don't know if that's positive or, or negative. I don't have any judgmental uh, issue there. But it's true that many times these two worlds have completely different uh, languages, going back to the idea of language. Mm -hmm. And many times it's very risky to bring them together because they seem not to match. And probably it's the case of this book. Sometimes it's like they have made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the case, but we tried. <laughs> no. um, <clears throat> it's eight. 12, and I believe um, uh, we might uh, uh, try to wrap this thing up. Um, I mean, we did talk about, I started saying that I felt violence, no? but we did talk about violence, and we talk about very difficult things like migration, technology, automation, slavery, freedom, and, and the, the, the subjects could continue endlessly. How do we produce a, a kind of a lexicon of contemporary issues that we believe are urgent and and need to be addressed from a multiplicity of lenses. I think that's probably one of the things that this book really stands for, yeah. even through a kind of a different disguise cover. <laughs> um, uh, the, the message that I have behind in my bag is actually making me very nervous, uh, because it says doing nothing is a form of agency. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, um, I always say, when you do nothing, someone else is doing it for you, mm -hmm. no? And so the question is, what kind of agency? And yeah. and and. And, and of course, that one is referring to another form of agency and a different kind of nothingness. Um, I want to congratulate you in your somethingness <laughs> and also in this nothingness that is not there um, and for this conversation tonight. Um, please uh, thank them for this fabulous talk. And let's get that book. <laughs>